Awesome. Well, I'm so excited to be up here today to share with you what the Lord's put on my heart. Um, Coming into the new year, you know, it's the time when people really resolve for better things in their life. Uh, Some make resolutions for a better job or a better marriage or a better relationship with the Lord. We all want that do-over from time to time. Amen? Amen. A chance to do something again and to hopefully do it better and to get different results in that. But I kind of have a thing with um, New Year's resolutions and because the Lord is so much bigger than one time a year. And we miss that opportunity. We don't really think about the simplicity of when the Lord promises new things for our life. And so today I am going to, my message is titled, All Things New. So Revelations 21.5, then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, right, for these words are true and faithful. God has been in the business of making all things new from the beginning of time. We look in the Bible, Adam and Eve, when they were cast out of the garden, things had to become new again. The relationship between God and man needed to be changed and restored, and God was making those necessary changes to bring man back to him. And then when we look, when the sin of man reached its fullest, God found Noah, and through the flood, he was able to make all things new again. And then Abraham comes along, and God started a new relationship with man at that pivotal point. Thank you. And then 400 years later came Jesus, who gave us the ultimate new beginning. A new beginning is the opportunity to wipe the slate clean and to start over. A God-granted opportunity to start again. And in my mind, this is not occasional. This is not once a year. This is not something that is just hopeful and wishful thinking. This is every day. Lamentations 3.22. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions fail, never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So we have the spiritual side of new beginnings, which is salvation, being born again, when our hearts are submitted to God so that the Holy Spirit can take control of our lives, just like we were singing this morning. 2 Corinthians 5, it says, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And through this, your life can be God-directed at that point, leading you to live the full abundant life that he has promised for you. That slate has completely been wiped clean for you. The decisions that you make are different. The way you choose to see challenges changes. The events in your life take on new meaning. Your purpose becomes clearer, and your faith walk becomes more confident with that newness. And throughout your walk with God, you will need the benefit of new beginnings because we stumble and we fall and we fail and we make mistakes. And that's where you need the grace of God to start over every time. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't always get it right the first time or the second time and sometimes the third time. It takes me a while, but we don't have to get it right the first time. It's a process and one that we spend our whole life trying to perfect. And that's the grace of God. And I mean, nobody likes starting over. I mean, crazy people do, but it's a lot. It's hard to start over when life forces you in situations to take that step to start something new. And it's scary, and it's hard, and it's exhausting. I can't even count how many times I've had to start over in my life. And it does. It gets exhausting. And that's why so many people stay in a job that they're not happy with and in unhealthy relationships, because it's easier than starting over. But starting over can be exciting, it can be invigorating, and it can be rewarding, but there's no point in starting over if you're not going to be willing to grow, and if you're not going to be willing to learn. So today I want to talk about three things, touch on three things that I believe um, come with that new beginning. So the first one is letting go. We need to learn to let go. Philippians 3.13 says, I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet, but one thing I do, it is my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. So here Paul's talking about forgetting those things which are behind us, the failures, the hurts, the disappointments, the stupid decisions we make, and the sin that we fall into. 
It's where we repent, we confess it, and we forget it, and then we move on from it. Because God is not interested in our past. He wants our present, and he wants our future. But only through him can we have a future worth having, amen? We don't have to live our lives in prison by the past. We hold ourselves hostage to it because of the failures that we've had. And it's really, you know, we, we get imprisoned by that, and, and we know that we've all failed in some way. When you look around and you think of your life, and, you know, maybe for you it's a, a failed relationship, or you made the wrong decisions, said the wrong things, or some of you who are parents in here probably know that you failed with your kids in some way. I mean, mine didn't. I don't. Well. <laughs> it's funny, because a little story. Um, a couple weeks ago, my son brought me, he showed me this video that he found on my old laptop, and it was, he, he was like two years old, and it was literally like a 30 second clip, if that, and he was talking about this puppy movie, and I just started weeping, like uncontrollably crying, and I watched it like 10 times just to torture myself, and he was laughing at me, he's like, what? He's like, Hanny, just, mom, like, why are you crying? And like, for them, they don't get it, they're not parents, because I saw that, he, they're seeing this cute video of when he was a kid, and all all I see is my failings when he was little about how hard it was and the things that I did wrong and hoping and praying that the account I have set aside for their therapy doesn't need to be paid out. <laughs> and we're getting close, right, honey? <laughs> my kids are great. They're blessed. That money will go to their college fund. But as a parent, I feel like that's the weight that we carry the most. There is honestly nothing like mom guilt, if anybody, <laughs> the parents in the house can attest to that. So it's more likely, too, that many of us have failed ourselves in some way, or even the Lord, where we carry that, right? And it's easy to be defined by one moment in life, by a divorce or a business that didn't work. Anything that has, has come up with the mistakes of our kids and relationship lost. The enemy is called the accuser for a reason. He would love to convince you that that one moment, that one mistake that one season of time to cause you to live down on yourself and not be passionate about the dreams that the Lord has placed in your heart and for the life that he has for you to, you to pursue your destiny and to trust him and believe him in the life that he has for you. We talk here about your identity, uh, your purpose and your destiny. That is what our, our mandate is to help you guys discover. And uh, you know, my dad talks all the time about your keynote message. And for me, my life, for a, a piece of it, a major piece of it, my keynote message in life is to make sure that everybody that I come in contact with knows that they are loved and knows that they are worthy of what the Lord has for them, despite their mistakes, despite their past and the missteps, that you are not disqualified. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, you are more than worthy for what the Lord has for you. God's word says to us that we must not allow ourselves to be dog bogged down by our past failures or the fear of failing again, because how many know once you fail, you're, you're afraid to take that step again where you're not sure because the outcome didn't, wasn't what you wanted it to be in the first place. But dwelling on that stops you from moving forward into that future. So we have to be able to let it go because how many know that failing isn't falling down, but it's the act of staying down? That's failure. But failure is the opportunity to begin again and more intelligently because your past doesn't determine your future unless you allow it. So you need to let yourself off the hook. You release that perfection, let go of expectation, and forgive yourself because it's hard to trust the person you are when you are still attached to the person you once were. So you have to be able to let it go. David is a great example of this. He was known for so many things. He was the man after God's heart. He was a warrior, but he was also a womanizer and conspiracy with murder. And despite all of that and more, David was never afraid to start over with God. And each time that he began fresh, he would repent and pray, and then he would walk away in freedom. In Psalms 18, it says, The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has rewarded me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord. I am not guilty of turning from my God. 
All his laws are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. I have been blameless before him and have kept myself from sin. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. Now, does that sound to you like someone who walks around being burdened by guilt? When he can boldly say, I walk free of sin and I walk in the righteousness of God and he is blessing my life. So is that him walking in denial? I don't think so. I truly believe that he understands what the newness God offers and he walks in that confidence. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to believe the word of God and trust him that he is giving us that new clean slate. Our inability to let things go in our life keeps us bound. And not only that, but by allowing others and their thoughts and opinions of us regarding who we are or who we once were also keeps us bound. There is such a weight that comes with people and their opinion and, and their words. They really strike deep, I feel. Even when it's people you don't really know, the, the opinion of our peers, it seems to hit us pretty hard. So we have to be able to walk through that as well. The Apostle Paul was known for uh, the persecution of those who believed in Jesus, but then all of a sudden he's claiming to be a Jesus believer himself. So he, he became what he was ultimately trying to kill. And nobody would accept the new Paul. Nobody would allow him the opportunity to show that he deserved a new start. They held his past sins against him, unwilling to let him forget who he once was. And he had to ignore this and choose not to believe the conviction that the people were putting on him and to walk in that conversion in fact, in Galatians 1.13 here, he writes, and he's almost kind of telling them off a little bit with his, his arrogance, his confidence. <laughs> Galatians 1.13, for you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. He didn't care what anybody had to say. He wasn't going to let the, the opinions and people that knew him prior change the path that the Lord had put him on and saved him from the life that he was living. So don't live in your past just because other people keep reminding you of it. I know I had like a hard time, you know, when I was a teenager and especially being a pastor's kid. And I feel like I'll always preach about being a pastor's kid because it's a different life. Like unless you're one, you don't really get it. So I feel like a whole life's message can be preached at that. <laughs> so just like keep interjecting in there. But because you're, the limelight's always on you. Everybody's watching you. You know, there's expectation, there's pressure. But growing up being with the same people, I found that when I stepped into adulthood and had a family of my own and a business and kind of matured out of that, there were a lot of people that had walked with me my whole life and wouldn't allow me to mature past my 14-year-old Jen. The one with tons of attitude and <laughs> Donna, <laughs> she's going to attest to this. Um, you know, just the w typical teenager, right? And so, but I felt, and then all of a sudden, because people weren't allowing me and looking at me in that way, it was hard for me to look at me that way, to look at myself as mature and to look at myself as worthy of something more. So it causes you to shrink back if you allow that to, to get into your head. So we really have to be free of that. Because God sees a brand new person when we make that decision to start over. So we have to see that. And we have to walk in that confidence. Because his mercies are new every morning. So I don't know why we don't receive that. And I know for me, it's one of my biggest battles. And as I was writing this, I was kind of laughing to myself because I feel like every time I preach, I say it's my biggest battle. So it makes it seem like I have these really big battles. But <laughs> there's all the time where like the things I struggle with, I want to share with you guys because I know that probably you're going through similar situations and similar things. But this is hard for me because I wake up feeling the weight of yesterday's choices and failures every morning. And... I need to learn that if God has given me a second chance, then I should probably give myself a second chance also. Because the Lord wants us to wake up every morning renewed, full of hope, full of grace, and full of mercy. 
because he gives us that strength for today and the hope for tomorrow. So holding on is believing that there is only a past, but letting go is knowing that there is a future. And so the second thing, so we let go and then we look forward. We let that past go and we look forward because each morning is a new opportunity to reflect on God's work in your life. Each and every day when that slate is wiped clean by the sacrifice that Jesus paid for us, we know that God is faithful. We know that his mercy will not run out, that no matter how far we feel from him, he is always right by our side. And the word new is a promise of new experiences, new boundaries being pushed, and new heights being exceeded. Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord is offering to anyone who dares to ask these new things, which will and can change your life forever. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to be bold enough to ask of the Lord for the new things that he has for you? Boldness. God is saying to you today, you have no idea, no idea of all that I plan to do through you. Just because things seem bad today doesn't mean they will be bad tomorrow. I've got big plans that you can't see at the moment, but the day will come when all these things will come to pass. So take hold of the promises that God places in your heart and never give up. J.C. Watts said a quote, it doesn't take a lot of strength to hold on, but it takes a lot of strength to let go. So as we look to the future, how do we do that? We look to the future by focusing on what the Lord places in your heart, by trusting him, his timing, his ways. We look to the future by learning and growing and staying hungry for the things of God. We look to the future by releasing our faith and remembering that we are partners with God. And I love that, Dad, you spoke that with the offering because that just that's exactly it. It's a partnership where we work hand in hand together. So don't work, worry about how far you have to go. You need to look at how far you have come and celebrate that progress. I feel like we don't give ourselves enough credit for how much that we do grow and the things that we do learn along the way. And the first step toward getting somewhere is the decision that you're not going to stay where you are. One step, first step, decide that you are going to continually move forward. So there's two things that I feel like we can use to work to take that step. And the first is to work on yourself. When God gives you that second chance, you need to take that opportunity to grow and to work on yourself. Whether you go on a retreat or get a quiet, into a quiet place and be more silent, spending time in the word, where you reflect on your life or start to journal or start to read more, uh, set goals for your life. This positions you and prepares you for the call that God has placed on your life and what he has for you. So we take that time as we're moving forward and we grow. And second, we change the behaviors that we used to have. So when we repent, that repentance is more than just about being sorry for what we did and the burden that we feel from the consequences of that sin. It's also about turning away from the things that led you down that path in the first place. We talk about the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Don't walk in insanity. As you start a new journey, make better decisions that you can be proud of that will bring positive fruit into your life. Engage in behaviors that will grow your faith, that will grow your finances, that will grow your relationships, your health, your career. We have a bright new hope we're not yet where we should be, but we definitely are not what we once were. And we need to recognize that. And every day that we stick with God, we make some sort of progress. Psalms 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are directed and established by the Lord. When he delights in his way and he busies himself with his every step. Now, I don't know. Uh, and he, Okay, it's a different version, but... Um, so in the, new, the 
amplified classic, I think it's called, whatever the C stands for. Anyways, so in that bracket, it says, when he says, and he busies himself with his every step. So it is the he busies himself, that is the Lord, that is capitalized, that is he busies himself with my every step. So I don't have to. So we are not, because like we take the life and we just like fill it. I'm the worst for that. I just fill it. But how many know that we are not called to be busy? We are called to be fruitful. So we need to be cautious of what we put our time into because it's not just about living and going through the motions and through our days of work and kids and marriages and paying bills and dot, 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 and repeat and repeat and repeat. For me, I spend a lot of days waking up being anxious and spending the day feeling insufficient and overwhelmed and then going to bed carrying that guilt, hoping that tomorrow will be better. Where I'm like, Lord, sorry about that. I really dropped the ball today. Tomorrow's going to be better. And most of us live in that, anxious about something, worried about something. But the Bible tells us, do not be anxious about anything. In Philippians, there's one writer that called worry a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. And John Hagee, I love this one. He says, worry is anxiety over the future that dominates the presence. It robs us. It robs from us. And many people are living in these lives of quiet desperation. They are troubled from their past and fearful of the present and anxious about the future and unable to break loose from that unrest. But I, I heard a quote this week which I was super stoked about because it fit right in. And take this. Worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Right? Jesus died so that we can have and enjoy life and to the full until it overflows. Amen? We need to let that worry go. We need to let that anxiety go. We pray, we ask, and we receive so we can enjoy that life because we only get one life. Do you ever stop to think about that? Like the overwhelming of we only get one life. There is no do-overs. And for me, I don't want to get to the end and have any regrets because I chose to not do something out of fear, say, fear of failure, uh, whatever the case may be. And a really good way to attack those fear is to name it. Name your fear, put a face on it, because you can defeat an enemy you can see. But if you just walk in fear and you don't pinpoint where it is, you're just gonna be bound. You're never gonna be free and loosed from that. And so we let go, we look forward, and then we enjoy life. Ephesians 5:15. Look carefully then how you walk. Live purposefully and worthily and accurately, not as the unwise and witless, but as the wise, sensible, intelligent people, making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. We are to enjoy our lives, making the most of it, appreciating how far we've come, appreciating what we've worked so hard for. I find that probably the number one thing in my life, um, well, for physical stuff, um, is my home. My home in Drayton. I love my house. Like, it is just everything that I could hope and dream in a place. And it is my peaceful place. And I've never really been a settled person. I've moved around a lot. I've never really felt like at home. And this was the first time when I really felt like settled, where it was home. And I sit in my house more often than not, if not daily, and just be thankful and just enjoy it. And to look around and think of all the new starts that got me here, all the do-overs, all of the, you know, pushing through and the fighting and, and the striving and then just getting there. And then I sit and I look and I see what the Lord has done for me. And so I enjoy what he blessed me with. It's okay to enjoy the things that the Lord gives you. He blesses our lives for that purpose because he wants us to have those great gifts, just like we do for our kids. I want my kids to have everything. And I mean, they're very expensive in their taste, so I'm doing my best, but I want to give them everything. <laughs> so I know when I talk, uh, preach, or do any sort of tithe message, I talk lots about living with expectation because our expectations limit our lives if we aren't expecting the right things. Expectancy determines your outcome, so we need to expect good things. 
And not even that we need to expect great things. So pay attention to what you're expecting because I feel like we subconsciously like have it in our heads that everything is going to go wrong and what, go, what can go wrong will. And then we just have it in our minds like that no good is going to come or we're going to something and already think it's going to fail. Where we need to be more conscious of that. We need to be intentional about what we're expecting because our exp- expectations are our faith at work. So dream big, expect great things. You should get up every morning and say, something good is going to happen today. If you have to put it on a sticky note and stick it on your bathroom mirror, on your door, walking out of your bedroom, make that declaration for your life with the expectation. Say it with me. Something is good good is going to happen today. Say it for your life. Because you deserve the blessing. You deserve the blessing of that new job of a successful business, of a successful marriage, or even that spouse that you're praying for, those children that you're praying for, that home that you're praying for. You deserve great things. And whatever it is, you deserve those blessings, so own it. Take ownership of those blessings because they are yours to enjoy. And with that enjoying your life, we should change our habits When we start our mornings, I don't know what everybody's morning routines are. I feel like everybody's kind of so different, but I can guarantee that the first thing that everybody does when they get up in the morning is check their phones. You don't think about it as being the start of your day, but it is. And there's actually psychologists that say that checking your phone with your text and your emails first thing in the morning leads to feelings of stress and anxiety, and then that sets the mood for the rest of the day. So whether you realize it or not, so change your habits. How about starting your day with the Lord? Start your day with worship. Many new beginnings, most of the new beginnings of the stories in the Bible start with worship. So you look back at all that God has done for you. You think about all of what he has saved you from, what he's protected you from, what he's taken you from and pulled you out of. And then you read a psalm. Do a simple devotional, play your favorite worship songs, and just draw close to the Lord. It doesn't have to be a three-hour episode. It doesn't have to be this daunting, like, pull at you, force you have to do it. It's the little things. Just change your habits. And secondly, to enjoy your life, change your name. So let me ask you a question. What would you like to be known for? Many people who had new beginnings in the Bible got a name change. We look at Abram, went to Abraham, Simon became Peter, Saul became Paul, and Jacob became Israel. And I'm not saying go out and change your name and all of a sudden now I got to remember everybody else's new names. Not saying that. When I'm talking about a new name change, I'm talking about starting to carve out a new reputation and to work on transforming your story. So, if you were in debt, you change your name to someone who has gained control of your finances. If you are angry, change your name to someone who is at peace with yourself and with others. If you are insecure, change your name to somebody who is confident. If you're known for being negative, work on becoming known for being positive and uplifting. Whatever transformation looks like for you, work towards it. Because when God gives you a chance to start over, he's giving you an opportunity to be known for something different. You get to decide that. You get to make that choice. Never underestimate the power you have to take your life in a new direction. It's never too late. We learn from our past, but we choose not to live in it. We move on. You have a great God who loves you and cares about you and has arranged the great life for each one of us. So we need to get in agreement with God and his word about what he has for our life. The start of something new brings the hope of something great. So we let go, we look forward, and we enjoy life. The newness which Jesus brings is bright and clear and enduring. By his sacrifice, we have new birth. By his grace, he's given us a new outlook and way of life. 
By his love, we have a new relationship. We are God's children. By his power, we have a new freedom. We are no longer enslaved to sin, but set free. By his spirit, we have a new heart. We are dead to sin and alive in Christ. By his word, we have a new direction. By his promises, we have a new confidence. By his authority, we have a new security, assurance of our salvation. By his church, we have new resources for spiritual growth. By his wisdom, we have a new purpose, meaning, and reason for living. And by his sovereignty, God declares over our lives, behold, I have made all things new. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Jesus, I thank you so much, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning, that your faithfulness is everlasting, and the plans that you have for us are great. So today, Lord, we draw a line in the sand that leaves the past behind. We rise above our circumstances, above the anxieties of the day, above the failures of yesterday, and above the fears of tomorrow. We choose to be in the moment, free and fearless, knowing that each day you have given us is the gift of a fresh start. So we make that decision today, Lord, to let go of the past and the thing that keeps us bound. We look to the future with great hope and expectation and enjoy the life that you have given us to the fullest. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for coming to church. Wednesday night, please come out, help and encourage and those who are stepping out, and it'll inspire you to step out, to discover your giftings, and if you don't know it's a gifting, then come and try. You'll find out very quickly. So it's a safe place, and we welcome everybody to join us. So bless you. Great to see you, and have a wonderful week.